Welcome to Systemic Oppression, Effects on Policy, Culture, and Outcomes, a special series in the Equity Clinic. This workshop is a sample from our three semester unit course available to school systems through A.L. Berry Consulting in partnership with your local university. For more information, email toolkit at alberryinc.com. I'm Almitra Berry. How are the children? This is not only a foundational question that frames the work, part of our mission here at A.L. Berry Consulting, but it is the greeting of the Maasai of Kenya and Tanzania. In their language, Kesarian in Kera. It acknowledges the value that the Maasai always place on their children's well being. It reminds us that protecting and nurturing the children is the collective responsibility of the society, its function, and its purpose. I like to think that as members of the K 12 school community, whether you are a school district or LEA employee, or what I refer to as an education adjacent professional, that's a sales rep or a consultant that provides services to K-12 schools, it's our proper function. So I challenge you today to make it your greeting. Rather than ask your peers in the teacher's lounge or in passing in a training session or sales call, hey, how are you doing today? When you greet one another, Put your purpose first and ask instead, how are the children? Now I invite you to close your eyes and take five seconds to let that practice resonate. So yes, that's me as a second grader back in 1969, at a time when children who looked like me did not always have access to high quality education. At a time when schools with black and brown children lacked resources to instructional materials. At a time when black and brown children were disproportionately represented in special education classrooms and dropout statistics. In fact, I was placed into a special education classroom that year, not because I couldn't learn, not because I was behind. In fact, I was about two years ahead of grade level at the time. The placement was because I was black. And there were only four of us at my elementary school. Hmm. Not much has changed. What you cannot see in that picture is that I am the fourth great granddaughter of Putu Gushalar, who came to this country in the belly of a slave ship. I'm the child of an educator and an entrepreneur, a product of the public school system in California, a graduate of the University of California at Davis. Go Ags. The second generation doctor, a second generation doctor of education, a trauma survivor, the second of three generations of Army women, an emergent bilingual, and a published author. In fact, the second edition of my book, Affecting Change for Culturally and Linguistically Diverse Learners, was released the summer of 2021. And you'll find a link in the comments below. The book will be referenced in this workshop. In our time together, I'll focus on guiding you through four actions. One, examining the elements that result in system-wide suppression of academic achievement for Black, Latinx, and Indigenous learners. Two, deconstructing a practice or policy. And three, appraising that practice or policy for systemic oppression. And then four, reframing that policy or practice justifying how the new policy would raise awareness to the existence of systemic oppression and work to eliminate it. To do that work requires some foundational understanding and I'll use my favorite iceberg metaphor here. Those of you who've attended some of my other workshops are familiar with the iceberg and you may notice the labels are a little different. You're not mistaken, hang on. When we work with policies and practices, we're going to examine them much like this iceberg. There's the part that's above the surface. This is what we can, this is the impact that we can observe. We can see it. It shows in our data. Whether we connect the data outcomes to a policy or practice or not, it's there. It's evident. Just below the surface lie our values and beliefs about the way things should be. These may show themselves from time to time. We may be somewhat cognizant of them. They may surface during conversations in professional learning, 
planning and discussion centered on curriculum and instruction. And they are shaped by our fundamental beliefs about the students we are employed to serve. Those beliefs are so far below the surface, we may not even know they exist. Those fundamental beliefs are called implicit or unconscious bias. The big idea is that policies and practices are shaped by lenses of implicit bias that adults bring to the K-12 system. And no matter what your role, teacher, leader, consultant, sales rep, product developer, author, you act on those implicit biases. And those biases result in systemic oppression. Stay with me, please. I'll frame this into our guiding question. How does systemic oppression show itself in policies and practices that impact student academic and behavioral or disciplinary outcomes? Now, I will focus primarily on academic outcomes today, but there are undisputed correlations between academics and discipline, but that's topic for another session. I know that if you are new to the equity journey or working with others who are, the conversations are sometimes difficult. So I developed the Equity Conversations Protocol to help foster those conversations. If you're not familiar with my Equity Conversations Protocol or ECP, check out the workshop, the Equity Conversations Protocol. It's available on the same channel. And when you do, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay on top of any new content that we release on the topic of equity. And while there's lots of talk about equity, which I define simply as education without bias against or favoritism for any group, many organizations have not defined equity for themselves. Think about your own organization for just a moment. What does equity mean in your school, your district, your LEA, or your organization? There are four think about it's in this workshop, and I invite you to press pause, jot each one down, think on each before moving on, share them with your colleagues in your next um, PLC or, or work session. Begin to do some of the work introduced in this session. Now press pause if you need to. I'll be here when you're ready to move on. Let's start with our first action. Let's examine the elements that result in system-wide suppression of academic achievement for Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and other learners of color. Every time I make this statement, someone questions why those particular groups. So let me give you the rationale, which is discussed in chapter two of my book, Affecting Change. Of all the demographic subgroups, Black learners consistently score the lowest on the NAEP, the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Indigenous learners score just slightly above them, Latinx, Latino, Latina, the highest of these three groups. At eighth grade, we're talking about 15% of Black learners, 19% of Indigenous learners, and 22% of Latinx learners scoring at proficient, compared to 42% of white learners and 54% of Asian Pacific Island learners. Black and Indigenous learners are outscored by students eligible for the National School Lunch Program. My why lies in the data. Or as I've said previously, it's better to be poor than to be Black or Indigenous in America's public school systems. On your own, outside of this workshop, I suggest you take a look at the NAEP data and compare it to the results of your state assessment. Look at the data disaggregated by subgroup. Beyond Black, Indigenous, and Latinx, look at outcomes for learners who qualify for the National School Lunch Program. Look at learners with disabilities and look at English learners as well. Look at the state level that corresponds to proficient, indicating a student shows competency over grade level content a level of mastery, not basic, which often indicates a learner is approaching grade level. 
I often look at state data and their talking points tout the percentage of students who are at a level which does not represent mastery. I also see states shifting cut scores to get a rosier picture of performance. So why the NAEP? Because it, and perhaps some of the nationally normed assessments you may use in your LEA are the most reliable indicators of learners' mastery and their ability to later compete for positions in out-of-state and private colleges and universities or in the global marketplace. We shouldn't expect our learners to grow up, work their entire lives, and die in the neighborhood they currently live in. We should prepare them for a global workforce. To do anything less is to do harm to children. And why do we see the achievement gaps we do? I'll provide my top four elements that contribute to the data we see. Implicit bias, racism, provision gaps, and culture. Let's start with implicit bias. If I asked you which line segment was longer and you had to choose one, would you choose the red or the blue? Implicit bias tells us it's the blue line. Our perceptions are biased by the shapes of the ends. The segments are actually the same length. How about if I asked you how this image makes you feel? What thoughts run through your head? Does this image make you smile? Were you taken aback? Concerned? Fearful? What about this image? How does it make you feel? What thoughts run through your head? Does it make you smile? Are you taken aback? Concerned? Fearful? Our perceptions shape our thoughts, our emotions, our micro expressions and microaggressions. Both of these groups of boys are hunting. The black boys are using a box and string to catch pigeons. The white boys are using rifles. Your implicit biases shape how you feel about each. Which group makes you smile? Which group causes you concern or fear? And our biases cover a myriad of things beyond race, ethnicity, gender, age, sexual orientation, and physical abilities that we most often think of and deal with in the K-12 setting. Everyone comes to work or to school with implicit biases about all those things you see on the outside of this wheel. Everyone's lived experiences shape their biases. And so I return to the iceberg of bias and consider that all those things that you can observe above the water, the top of the iceberg is explicit bias. I'm gonna ask you to think back to your response to the two pictures of, of the boys hunting just a moment ago. If I asked you to consider the data that 79% of all K-12 school shootings were the result of white, often middle-class perpetrators, would one image cause you concern over the other? Having implicit bias is perfectly normal. It is a normal psychological phenomenon. But where implicit bias taints policies and practices, curriculum and instruction, we harm children. We must make sure that to do the courageous work, to rise above it, professional learning should address uncovering it naming it and eliminating it from our organizations, from our policies and procedures, from our materials and our methods. Implicit bias. So let's move on to our second element, which is racism. It's important, it's important first to understand what I mean when I talk about race. I'm talking about the social construct that references shared ancestry of a group of people. I am not referring to ethnicity, which is in reference to a shared cultural background. These two young ladies you see on screen are biological sisters. In fact, they're fraternal twins. And they should make each of us reconsider everything we think about race, 
The social construct of race would likely have you see one of these twins as black and one as white. This is genetics, science. Whereas race, as we tend to use it, is more social. When I refer to racism, I'm talking about a mindset where people make broad judgments about groups of people, where they paint them with a broad brush of inferiority or superiority based on some characteristics, abilities, or qualities. Race was created by white Europeans to make sense of the way they wanted to see the world and hold power in it, especially in the early years of the American colonies. This social construct and the racism that was then built upon it is what has al what allowed the institution of slavery and subsequent torture of black people in this country for more than 400 years to remain acceptable, normal. Racism is what allowed the extermination and forced assimilation of the first nations of this geographical place now known as the United States. Remnants of both of these government policies, the implicit bias and explicit bias that it has normalized impact the academic outcomes we see in our black and indigenous learners to this day. The construct of race and its inherent racism were cooked into the American culture. Over those centuries, it has manifested as systemic racism, policies that have been voted on and enacted, methods and beliefs about instruction that have been institutionalized through our teacher colleges, curriculum choice and format and appearance that were developed by an overwhelmingly privileged white cisgender male leadership in educational publishing and middle-class white authors, editors, and sales teams. Racism. Element number three is provision gaps. Now provision gap is not the same as an achievement gap, which I addressed earlier. I want you to think of instruction as a tree perhaps like the apple trees you see on the screen. Student outcomes are the fruit. And in this image, we see a variety of apples, a variety of outcomes. The outcomes are what are measured and reported. Outcomes are what we call an achievement gap. But where does the gap come from? It is directly related to the instruction that was provided. Provision is at the root of the tree. Roots are generally hidden. So if a tree is fertilized by implicit bias, you'll have roots that are a provision gap and there is never any accountability for the provision gap. We don't measure it. That gap is on us, the adults in the schools, the district, the publishers who claim that their content or approach is good for all learners when in fact it is not. Let that marinate for a minute. True, learners will develop regardless of what is done to them. And I said that correctly. Learners will develop regardless of what is done to them. It is what develops and how it develops and how the learner suffers or benefits from it in the long run that matters. Much like the plants that have begun to overtake the abandoned Packard plant in Detroit, Children not provided quality instruction and socio-emotional learning and support will consume the systems available to them. The systemic oppression entrenched in policies and practices creates trees that are not beneficial to their environment. They fuel the dropout rates and the school to prison pipeline. And you, have the power to begin to change that. Think about it for just a moment. If your district has an achievement gap, do you think it may be due to a provision gap? For those of you who are education adjacent, my friends in the publishing industry and um, instructional support, let me reframe it for you. If your client schools and your client districts have achievement gaps, do you think it may be due to a provision gap? As an example, there's overwhelming data on literacy that tells us that explicit systematic instruction and in synthetic phonics in the science of reading 
is the best way to teach every child to read, write, and think on time and on grade. So if you have an achievement gap in reading, why would you ignore the science in favor of something that is not in the best interest of your learners or your clients' learners? And again, this is a good spot to press pause and reflect on the question on screen. Now, our fourth and final element is culture. Culture is defined as the information, norms, values, behaviors, and morals of a group. These things, much like the implicit biases, are socially transmitted. We learn them from being around a group of people. When you were a child, no one set you down and gave you a lesson on the culture of your home. When you got a job, most likely no one called you into HR for a lecture on the culture of the organization. So how did you learn what was and was not acceptable? We begin to answer that question through understanding what cultural competency is. It's not just having the ability, knowledge, and skill to navigate within a variety of cultures that we're immersed in on a daily basis, like your culture of home, your culture of work, or driving on the roads of the town that you live in, but the ability to do the same thing in cultures where we have no familiarity. That could be the home culture of a learner who's recently immigrated from a cult country whose culture shares little with your own and for which you have no frame of reference. It could be the dominant culture of the majority of your learners where you have little or no familiarity and you haven't taken the time to immerse yourself in it in order to learn. To become cultur culturally competent is to navigate those spaces with respect and comfort and without offending the people in them. Think about the norms, values, behaviors, and morals of your learners' home cultures and the people in them. And that is why the culturally appropriate response to instruction framework you'll find in my book, Affecting Change, the CARDI framework, focuses first on building cultural awareness. But you cannot talk about culture unless you first become comfortable talking about bias, race, and racism and own that the achievement gaps we see in our schools are not the fault of the learner, but a result of the systemic oppression that pervades our policies and practices, our materials and methods. Our behavior as adults who should be focused on doing best what's, or doing what's best for children. Because that lack of cultural competence among the adults when policies and practices that carry implicit bias make it to the school level, they have a tremendous influence on what happens to our children, both academically and in terms of discipline, not just now, but over their entire lifetimes. So take a moment to think on this. What are you doing in your organization to increase cultural competence? Press pause if you need to. Our next action is to deconstruct a practice or policy. Deconstruction aims to disturb something in order to discover something. Mm -hmm. Kind of like when I was little and I would take apart things like clocks so I could see how they worked. By deconstructing and appraising a policy or practice, you should learn to understand the intent and impact of that policy or practice beyond its straightforward content. Through deconstructing and appraising, you uncover new meanings, subcauses of inequities, hardcore truths, and the origins of the inequities that you see. Just know that this process of deconstruction and appraisal has not only practical but political implications. Because as we deconstruct, we may find our way to the bottom of someone's iceberg. Now I'm going to give you a piece of an exercise that I do in workshop with organizations. If you're interested in learning more or having a workshop at your own school, just email toolkit at alberryinc.com for more information. Ready? There are three tasks on the screen based on role. Find yours, educator, board member, or education adjacent professional. Step one of the exercise is a reflection. 
Whatever three to five things you come up with should some way affect the academic, behavioral, socio-emotional, or disciplinary outcomes of learners. They should include any policies or practices that may connect to a provision gap or a discipline gap. These most definitely must include any policy or practice that you even remotely suspect may have been touched, tainted, or influenced by implicit bias. I'm gonna help you out by asking a couple of questions to fuel your thinking. So if this hurts, I'm sorry, um, but you need to sit in that. That's part of the work in the protocol. I'm not asking the questions to offend anyone. It's just that by its very nature in this work, reflection is sometimes personally painful, but no one can see you and no one knows your thoughts but you. So just think about how you can grow, learn, and do better. So if you're an educator, when you selected your curriculum, pick a subject, any subject, but reading and math always impact all learners. So they're the lowest hanging fruit. When you selected your curriculum, did you do so with an eye towards equity to make sure that there was scientifically validated instruction that would work for every child in your school? Did your teachers get equitable professional development in order to make sure your students all received equitable instruction in that curriculum or with that curriculum? Or did you select it for some other reason? You know, price, free materials, it was on the list. Teachers like the pictures, you like the philosophy of instruction. Okay, start thinking. Board members, when you developed or, or approved policies for face-to-face -face or remote or some blend of instruction during the COVID uh, shutdowns, did you do so with an eye towards equity to make sure that every child would receive the time and access to effective high quality instruction that they need in order to be as successful as they possibly can be? Or did you do it for some other reason? Did you bend to political pressure? Did you just do what the nearest large school district was doing? And finally, how did that work out for learners? Education adjacent professionals. When your company develops a program or professional development, does it do so based on the best science available in the subject area? When you market, position, and sell your content or support, do you provide honest, accurate information based on science and research in like demographics about how well it will work for your clients, learners? Or do you push a program or a product for some other reason like incentive compensation, a contest, or a performance goal. Ouch. Not trying to inflict pain here, but we have to take a critical look at our actions for the sake of our children. Press pause if you need to work through some of these before moving on. So step two, would be to prioritize that list that you created based on a single criterion. How big of an impact does each item have on your Black, Indigenous, and Latinx learners? And remember why I work on or focus on these three groups, Black, Indigenous, and Latinx learners. And keep an eye towards those things that may ultimately show up in benchmarking, accountability ratings, or your state assessment scores. Now for each item, you'll answer six questions. Question one, who is the policy or practice aimed at? Two, what does the policy or practice aim to do? Three, what are the most obvious effects of the policy or practice? Four, when did the policy or practice come into existence? Five, where is the policy or practice most often implemented or ignored? And six, what are the potential dangers of challenging this policy or practice? What are the potential dangers of not challenging it? Remember, deconstruction is about taking something apart so you can discover. You're looking for the intent and impact beyond the words. You may have some thoughts running through your head based on those six questions, but you're not done. 
you've deconstructed or once you finish your deconstruction, it's time to appraise. So you're going to assess the value or quality of the policy or practice specifically through the lens of equity to determine if it does, can potentially, or has contributed to systemic oppression. You'll uncover those meanings, subcauses, hardcore truths, and the origins of inequities through root cause analysis. Much like an iceberg, root cause analysis has the fruit you can see above ground, but the truth, the influence, deep perceptions upon which your policy or practice is based lies deep below the surface, in this instance, at the root. All you have to do is ask why. You'll find this activity in chapter four of Affecting Change. It takes five whys to get to the root, to the origins of inequities. As I mentioned, this is just a piece of the exercise. If you're interested in the full version of this workshop, email toolkit at alberryinc.com. As you engage in root cause analysis, you critically examine the systemic and structural features of your organization's practices and policies organized around the beliefs, attitudes, behaviors, and perceptions, the culture of the adults in your organization about children of color, particularly Black, Indigenous, and Latinx learners that result in their life prospects being affected differently. It's not going to be easy. You see, change, any change that challenges the, the culture of the status quo requires strategies and techniques that address inequality, unequal social relations, and unequal power relations. This work asks people to examine their potentially biased beliefs about ethnicity, race, gender, and social class. The response, though, is predictably validated by science, something I share in the full workshop, but I'm going to ask you to think about it one more time. What are your perceptions? What do you believe are some of the root causes of systemic oppression in your organization? What will be the hardest thing to address as you work to eliminate them? Okay, even though you've done abbreviated work, the last action is to reframe your policy or practice and to justify how a new policy or a new practice would raise awareness to the existence of systemic oppression and work to eliminate it. To create or increase academic equity, three things must happen as you prepare to reframe. First, you must expose things that hurt children. This means wherever you find implicit bias, you have to call it out. It could be that you notice patterns in who gets sent to the office on disciplinary charges because children out of class are not being taught, which means a provision gap that shows as an achievement gap, which affects your accountability rating. Maybe it's a pattern indicating orange learners struggle in certain classrooms or that a disproportionate number of purple children are struggling with math at a certain grade. It's not the children. It's something else. What is it? Call it out. Name it. Be transparent. Second, create structural equity. This is an easy fix. If it's how things are set up, it's structural. Simply fix the structural root problem so children have equitable learning opportunities. These are things like class size, group size, time in instruction, device distribution, curriculum selection, methodology choices, and implementation. Structural equity can be easily planned on paper or virtual paper. Often stru structural fixes have financial implications, so get your finance and budget people involved. Finally, you have to challenge anyone who may have a stuck mindset. We are all, every one of us, and I include myself in that number, complicit in inequity at some point in time. Anytime we ignore inequity instead of calling it out, we're complicit. If you notice a policy that is inequitable and remains silent, you're complicit. If you notice a blip in the data that makes you question whether educators are operating in the absolute best interest of their learners and you do not bring that concern to the appropriate leader, you're complicit. Challenge it. 
when people deny it. Otherwise, you can't fix it. And then you'd be ready to reframe your policy or practice mindfully. I've given you four questions to guide your reframing. Number one, what needs to change? Is it structural, like a schedule or class size, or is it cultural, having to do with individual belief systems or ideas about the children we serve or the, the best way to serve them? Is there any implicit bias that has to be addressed? I will say that cultural shifts are much more difficult than structural shifts, but often it is culture that has us working in the structure. So you have to look at both lanes on the road to equity, and I cannot underscore this enough. Culture is critical when it comes to addressing the needs of underserved populations. This is addressed throughout the book, Affecting Change. Two, what will the change improve? Quick fixes are not good for children. They need stability, particularly at a time where normalcy has been so disrupted due to COVID. We need solutions with long-term benefits. This means we have to consider what the learning trajectory looks like beyond the current school year. We need to be looking at three to five year learning trajectories while considering the impact of this disruption of school closures due to COVID. Three, how will the change work to eliminate the impact of bias, oppression, or inequity? We have to be mindful of any provision gaps and their time of origin. We have to consider the lack of instruction to some learners who've had disrupted formal education due to COVID closures or for some other reason. And we have to consider what gaps are being created and the time and intensity of instruction it will take to eliminate them. Again, that's a three to five year view. And finally, what are your accountability provisions? I don't just mean the ones from a governing agency or board of directors. I mean the day-to-day, -day, classroom to classroom, hour by hour accountability to one another as the responsible adults in roles that are supposed to serve the education of children. Leaders, have you codified that accountability? If not, make sure you do. If it isn't in policy, it doesn't exist. Think about that. The work that's done through deconstructing and reframing should help to broaden the lens of equity in your organization. This work is not easy and often we have so much on our plates it isn't prioritized, but it should be. This type of work helps us to recognize implicit bias, accept it for what it is, normal human behavior, but name it. Name it when it has negative effects on the learners or the culture of your organizations. Own it if it's your own implicit bias or if you have the responsibility to eliminate it from your organization or your team. This work helps us reflect on our purpose. Ask yourself, what is my purpose in the role that I hold? What is my purpose? Who do I serve and am I doing this to benefit the children? How should I focus my equity lens? This work helps us examine not only what is taught, but how it is taught and how learners learn it. Every learner. Because remember, when we reframe, we must justify how that new policy or how that shift in practice will raise awareness to equity, raise awareness to accountability challenges, and work towards remedies for all learners, but most importantly, the marginalized or underserved, our Black, Indigenous, and Brown learners. And when we have focused and broadened our lenses, we mature. To borrow from Maya Angelou's words, we know more, so we can do better. I'll begin to wrap up with one last thing about me, and that is that I'm a huge fan of using proverbs of various cultures and quotes from historical figures to raise our awareness on the richness of the diverse cultures of our students. The words I chose to close this workshop are those of Frederick Douglass, who said, those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. If you want to disrupt systemic oppression in your school or educational organization, get ready to agitate. 
Thank you for joining me for this session. If your district provided you this link as part of the equity audit process with A.L. Berry Consulting, they have access to additional activities that are part of this session. If you joined on your own and have questions or would like more information, please email toolkit at alberryinc.com. There are links to my book, Affecting Change for Culturally and Linguistically Diverse Learners, as well as the Equity Conversations Protocol Workshop down below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to us on social. Be well.